I'm continuing my coverage of the Kasparov Deep Blue match in Philadelphia 1996 and this is game three. Uh, first two games, well it was one win apiece, you can see the videos uh, on, on this site uh, covering those games, but Kasparov after his loss in game one was clearly pretty shocked and you know he had adapted his style a little bit even in just that one game. Now this is a repeat of game one and there um, Deep Blue had played h3 and Bishop h5 but Joel Benjamin the, the GM advisor to the Deep Blue team wanted to vary things a little so he just castled here instead and this is exactly the same as game one without h3 and bishop h5 and here in game one knight b5 was played uh, but Benjamin varies with knight e5 he had prepared this especially for this game um, of course the c3 Sicilian not the most testing uh, opening variation at Kasparov's level but I think the deep blue team were keen to play something you know reasonably sound but to steer away from Kasparov's incredible opening theory so 95 hitting the outpost reasonable move bishop e2 this is just about forced let me get to the the critical position in the game Kasparov exchanging pieces and 95 uh, obviously pawn takes knight will be met by Quintex pawn and Blackman's pawn, but bishop f4. So white isn't losing any pawns here. And, well, clearly, if castles, then pawn takes knight is, is unpleasant for black. So knight f3. This was all uh, Joel Benjamin's preparation, actually. But Kasparov must have been pretty happy with the outcome of the opening because he's managed to trade pieces. I think he was confident that he could play, for example, end games better than Deep Blue. Certainly, positionally, Deep Blue. I think we saw in Game Two that it had certain deficiencies. Can't really see these long-term patterns very well. And this kind of structure, these so-called hanging pawns, if they don't roll forward, potentially that's dangerous for White. We'll see that in a second still part of Benjamin's preparation. Now this is very important, so Kasparov begins the blockade of these pawns. So d5 solidly under control and now he takes c4 under control. So instead of castling, which would have allowed the, the c pawn to roll forward, he's blockading that square on c4. Um, after the game, Joel Benjamin said that he'd actually prepared or was thinking that bishop b5 was the move but Deep Blue didn't want to do this in the end. They hadn't actually kind of hardwired this into, into the opening book. Um, much, much to Benjamin's relief afterwards because this variation, which they thought was okay, actually loses a piece after Knight F6. Kasparov would have seen this. So that can't be taken because of the mate on G2. And after Queen H6, Knight H5 hits the bishop and the bishop is pinned that would win for black but deep blue uh, clearly managed to see that wasn't the line wasn't too long and played instead rook fc1 threatening to play c4 so here black needs to react black needs to blockade now b5 if black were castled then probably b5 might be a good move but if b5 then of course White has a lever to open things up and suddenly that's very dangerous. So Kasparov blockaded with the Queen and already this looks very pleasant for Black. And I think after Deep Blue's performance in Game 2 where it didn't really understand the pawn structure very well, I think Kasparov was probably very confident at this moment but here is where Deep Blue played excellently. Um, 
if White isn't careful, he's already lost in this position, I would say, in a, in a kind of higher sense. For example, let's, let's play a normal move. Let's throw the king in. Uh, I mean, the, the king probably belongs here, but in this case, this is a mistake. So let's, let's try this. So king d7, and now knight d5, hitting the bishop, the pawn, the bishop goes back. And you can see that with these fantastic blockaders on d5 and c4, pressurizing c3, black doesn't win this pawn straight away, but the long-term pressure that black has is just fantastic. And then c5 just clamps these squares. This is, well, impossible to say a winning position, but highly favorable for black. Basically, black will not let go of this bind. Now watch how deep blue manages to shake this. This is very impressive. First, rook b1, hitting that pawn. Okay, that gets defended by b6. Still hasn't shaken the blockade though. Bishop b8, excellent move. Kasparov said afterwards, the computer played the only moves that don't lose. I'd like to know how many humans would find this plan. Hitting the pawn, obviously if that moves then b6 is on, so black has to play rook a4. Well, so far so good. Kasparov is still hoping to return to this plan of blockading here. Still looks good, but let's see the idea. Those mo moves weren't so difficult to see. This is very impressive. First of all, rook b4. Now, if that's exchanged, then the a7 pawn is dropping. So the rook drops back. Okay, Kasparov still under control. Now, this is very clever. Kasparov said afterwards, any human would play c4 here almost instinctively without thinking. Problem is, if that happens, then black still has pretty good pressure on these pawns. That rook stands very well on a5, um, covering along the fourth rank, but also hitting the a pawn. Still better for black, that position. But this is impressive. Rook c4, very unusual move stepping in front of that pawn, but it works beautifully. So there's a threat here. Now the king has to get out. Bishop is attacked. So bishop comes back to d6, attacking the rook. Rook moves into the corner. And now rook c6. Now this looks slightly odd where these rooks are split. Normally rook, rooks work very well together. But the combination of these pieces means that black is simply unable to get any pressure on these c and d pawns. Also, that bishop blocks out the king. If black could magically move the king back into the center, this would be absolutely fine. But black simply cannot make progress here because these pieces well, really dominate uh, the center, actually. Black is not worse here. But Kasparov has to be a little bit careful. Let's see how the game developed. So the king comes towards the middle. Uh, d3 is really where the king belongs in these positions to safeguard those pawns. And now Kasparov decided to head for a draw. I think it's probably wise because, uh, you know, it could be that white manages to break open the position um, and get this rook in it's a little bit uncomfortable. So Kasparov played rook d8 and deep blue traded bishop for knight and unsurprisingly this position ended up as a draw. I think neither side can claim any advantage here. I mean obviously with the you know both sides have an active rook but it's going to be equal and after e5 well there were some liquidations in it and it headed to a draw. Kasparov was very impressed with Deep Blue's uh, defence, a very active defence in that game. So after three games, one and a half four, that was the first draw of the match. So going into game four, Kasparov with the white pieces and it's a Slav and Kasparov doesn't take any chances, protects that pawn, makes sure that Deep Blue isn't going for one of those sharp variations where you, you, you capture that pawn on c4. And they've reached a very orthodox variation, a very old variation actually, 
of the Slav and this is well known to be well just better for white you can see that white has the center um, and it's not so easy for black to to break out very quickly one would like to play e5 here the problem is there's a sensitive point here and here and after the trade on e5 then you can take on h7 and queen h5 and white has won a pawn for nothing so let's go back so this is a very well known position actually so black generally plays h6 just to guard against any threats on h7 bishop c2 this prepares a queen d3 in some cases um, e5 played so now black is breaking out but it's clear that white has much uh, better development than black you can see that bishop on c8 isn't coming out for a little bit and white has a little bit more space and these bishops trained on the king side certainly uh, look somewhat menacing but this is still actually you know this has been played before and knight f6 now this is a very interesting moment in the game Kasparov had a couple of retractive continuations but the most tempting one and he said he would have played this against the human opponent the most tempting move was bishop takes h6 and Kasparov said that well the reason he didn't do this was the slightest miscalculation in this line and you're dead so he was already uh, showing a lot of respect for deep blues calculating abilities okay what's what's the big deal let's 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 crunch this one out so first of all what happens if you take rook d1 you can see white's control of the center is basically the reason why this sacrifice is at all playable so rook hits the queen if the queen moves away from the knight that gets taken so knight d7 now black is bottled up and, and somehow very unsurprisingly this is looks like a winning attack for white um, rook g4 check threatened if uh, f5 then rook comes down to e6 I mean this looks pretty horrendous for black um, or h5 stopping rook g4 but then knight e5 I mean white basically just keeps going forward and black is so bottled up that it's very hard to defend um, well this way black manages to escape to an endgame but looks very very promising for white uh, with black split kingside pawns I suspect well I mean who knows what deep blue would have come up with um, it's all to do with the horizon the search horizon the depth that the machine can calculate um, if it had been able to calculate deeply enough it would have it would have rejected taking the bishop and I suspect it might have compromised and played bishop f2 check so after this little transaction material is even but black has avoided the shattering of his king side um, this is still clearly better for, for white though just because you know white has tremendous control in the center but it's not winning um, for white just very clear advantage this knight obviously not very well placed on the side of the board but interestingly Kasparov rejected this and instead played a much calmer move bishop e3 which still secures white some advantage you can see you know he, he's very well centralized here 
But by the same token, it's also not that bad for black, although black doesn't have much space and white is active. In fact, there are very few weaknesses in black's position and, well, once again, Deep Blue defended very correctly in this position and, well, there are quite a few adventures, but basically Kasparov couldn't couldn't break down the machine's defences. So I just thought that was a very interesting moment in the game. Um, Kasparov paying the deep blue a lot of respect. So after four games, the match was still tied. A winner piece and two draws in games three and four.